Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's a good place to be, ain't it? Sure is. Thank the Lord for all His goodness and thank Him for what He's done for us. And uh, Good to have you today if you're visiting with us. We appreciate you being here. And, and uh, uh, this, this, uh, this day's a special day. Uh, uh, we remember uh, this is Memorial Day weekend and and this is a this is a day we want to remember uh, the those that uh, gave all uh, for our freedom as a country and uh, and the POWs uh, that 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 didn't come home and those that died on the battlefield we 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 uh, we remember those and uh, this is a special day and we should never ever forget the price for our freedom as a country. And uh, and I, I believe that uh, I believe we have seen with our own eyes that uh, how other countries and under communist countries that don't have the freedom that we have. Um, I was I was listening to a preacher coming to church this morning, and uh, there there are some countries that it is illegal to have a copy of God's word. And uh, they, I mean, you will not only be arrested, but even martyred because of it. And so uh, there's, there's a, we, we live, and I believe we don't even realize uh, what, a, what a freedom that we have. And freedom didn't come free to us. Um, and I, I want you to know that uh, when, when, this, when this flag is, is reverend and, and uh, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance is, is, is given and uh, the, uh, uh, the national anthem is played. Uh, people died for that. Man. And it's the least we can do to stand to our feet and cross our heart and give reverence to, to this flag. But I want you to know uh, this flag means something too. There's a man named Jesus died for this flag right here. Amen. He died for your freedom. It's what, that's what that stands for too. Salvation's freedom. Amen. Amen. And, and we should never ever forget the price that's been paid for our salvation. What a great price. He gave his life. No man took his life. He laid his life down freely. And we, when we think about the freedom of our country, we think about the freedom of our salvation as well. So we, may we never forget. May we never, ever forget the freedom that we have today. And I sure am glad we've got this freedom. We've got freedom as, a, as, a, as an American, as a country, but also freedom in our salvation uh, that, that Jesus has set us free from the bondage of sin. Amen. Uh, good to be here today. Appreciate you being here. And, and uh, it's good to have uh, Waylon Williams with us today. This is Gary's, uh, Gary Phillips' brother, uh, uh, Mitchell's uh, grandson, and he's got the whole family with him. They're from North Wilkesboro, and, and that is right. And you're from North Wilkesboro, and uh, and he, uh, uh, the Lord called him to preach a year ago, and he's in, and the Lord's doing a great work uh, uh, through uh, his life, and and it, it's encouraging to see. And I mentioned this before. We've seen uh, God call um, Corbin and Caleb, and and. Uh, um, uh, Brian Brown's son that came and preached for us too. So God's calling uh, young men to preach, and 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 that is that's encouraging to me, because when you turn the news on and you see the current events, uh, we're living in a dark day, aren't we? And it's very discouraging to see how the wickedness is 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 just uh, waxing worse, as the Bible says. But it's encouraging to me that, that God's still calling men to preach His Word. Uh, that, that ought to give the sinner hope today and encouragement that, uh, that God's calling a man to tell them about Jesus. Tell them that there's hope for them. Amen? And so you pray for Him as He comes today. It sure is good to, good to have Him today. It's good to be in the Lord's house this morning. I'm thankful for all the many opportunities God's given me in the past year and a half. I, I answered the call, 
And uh, I'm thankful for it because there's so many people in these days that they just don't know what their purpose is in life. And there's so many young people that go through so many trials and errors and they just don't know, God, what am I supposed to do with my life? And I'm thankful that when I was a young child, I gave my life to Christ and later He called me to preach and I'm thankful for the many opportunities He's given me. I ask you to pray for me this morning. Calm my nerves. This is, it, it's something. The Lord's been awful good to me. God is good. I'm going to be doing a little bit of flipping around, but uh, like the preacher said, I'm from North Carolina. I'm from the, the area between Wilkesboro and Caldwell County. And so my mother's from Wilkesboro and my father's family's from Burke County. And so I kind of, I'm on that line between Caldwell County and Wilkesboro. But um, I'm thankful for all my family here. Like the pastor said, my uncle's Gary Phillips. Uh, don't hold that on me or nothing. But uh, <laughs> I love my uncle Gary. But um, anyhow, we're going to be opening our Bibles to Exodus chapter, let's see, 27 this morning. Like I said, I'm going to be doing a little bit of flipping around, so if you'd like to, you can join me. I'm thankful for God's Word this morning. I'm thankful for what He's done for me. In the book of Exodus, chapter 27, verses 1 through 8 say, And thou shalt make an altar of shatim wood, five cubits long and five cubits broad. The altar shall be four square, and the height thereof shall be three cubits. And thou shalt make the horns of it upon the four corners thereof, and his horns shall be the same. And thou shalt overlay it with brass. And thou shalt make his pans to receive his ashes, and his shovels, and his basins, and his flesh hooks, and his fire pans, and his vessels thereof. Thou shalt make of brass. And thou shalt make for it a grade of network of brass, and upon the net shalt thou make four brazen rings in the four corners thereof, and thou shalt put it under the compass of the altar beneath, that the net may be even to the midst of the altar. And thou shalt make staves with the altar, staves of shatim wood, and overlay them with brass. And the staff shall be put unto the rings, and the staff shall upon it the two sides of the altar to bear it. Hollow the boards shalt thou make it, and show thee in the mount, so thou shalt make it. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you thanking you for your many blessings, Lord God, for just the opportunity, Lord. Lord God, I want to thank you for safe travels, God. God, I ask you to use me. Might I be put to the side for the next few moments, God. God, I'm an empty vessel asking to be filled, Lord God. Would you use me? Use my lips. Use my tongue, God. Would you speak through me, God? I ask you, Lord, if they're a hungry person in the midst today, God. God, that they might be filled with your Holy Spirit, God. God, would you remind us to carry your word, Lord. Lord God, we love you and we thank you for your many blessings on us. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. For the last couple of months, I, I guess it's been months at this point, but um, for the last couple of months, I've been studying on the tabernacle of God. And for those of you who don't know, that is when the Israelites escaped from the slavery in Egypt, and they needed a place to meet with God. They were hungry for God's presence and God was hungry for His children. Aren't you excited that God had a want for us? Aren't you excited that God wanted His children? Amen? As we walk through the tabernacle, there's three different, I guess you could say, layers to the tabernacle. You have the court of the tabernacle and that's where I began talking about this altar. This altar was an altar for blood sacrifice and sacrifice by fire. It is where they would take an animal and they'd take this animal and they would sacrifice it hoping on the Day of Atonement, they'd take this animal and sacrifice it, hoping that their sins would be cleansed for one year on the Day of Atonement. This bronze altar was used for sacrifice by blood and fire, and this altar represents the sacrificial death of our Savior upon the cross of Calvary. And I'm thankful for the Lord and the sacrificial death upon the cross that gave me freedom, that I might enter in into God's presence, and that I might enter in into the holy place and the holy of holies, that I might meet with God whenever I please because of sacrifice. I'm thankful for this bronze altar. This altar means a lot. and Like we have altars at our churches, this altar was an altar of sacrifice. Just like we might give our lives to Christ, the life of an animal was given to God that it might cleanse those people of that time, that it might cleanse them and give them freedom from their sin. As Like I said, I'll be flipping around here. I'd like to walk through the tabernacle, if you will. I'd like you to walk with me through this court of the tabernacle really quickly and then to the holy place and then to the holy of holies once we get there. Exodus chapter 30, verses 17 through 21. Exodus chapter 30, 17 to 21. We talk about the bronze laver. This bronze laver was 
It was this thing, and it was beaten so perfectly from what the Bible tells us, is that when these priests look into the laver, it was as if they were looking into a mirror, and it was as if they were looking at themselves for who they were. And that's how you meet with God, through sacrifice. It is through the sacrifice of Christ, and it is through the cleansing water that we must wash in the laver that we can meet with God. Verse 17 says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt make a laver of brass with his foot also of brass to wash withal. And thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. And thou shalt put the water therein. For Aaron and his son shall wash their hands and their feet where thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near the altar to minister to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord. So they shall wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. And it shall be of a statute forever to them, even to him, to his seed throughout their generations. You see, before we come to God, we must come through a place of cleansing and washing. See, these these priests, like Aaron and his sons, the priests were forced to wash in this laver before they entered into the tabernacle. Like it said, they were to wash in there, that they not die or that they die not. It is by the washing and cleansing power of the Lord Jesus Christ that we might enter in unto God's presence, that we might meet with God. It is through this cleansing power by the blood of Christ. So the first thing we see here in the court of the tabernacle, we see the bronze altar, which is a sacrifice by blood, and then we see this this bronze laver, which is where we come to God in a form of cleansing. You see, throughout this book from Genesis to Revelation, oftentimes we see the stories of Jesus throughout the Gospels and we see His Spirit with His disciples later in Acts and thereafter in the New Testament. But oftentimes we haven't thought about where is Jesus in the whole Bible. I'll tell you from the books of Genesis to Revelation, Jesus Christ has taken a part in everything of every time, of every one. And I'll tell you today, it hasn't changed since then. Jesus Christ should take part in our homes and in our lives and in our marriages and in our families. Jesus Christ should take place in every single part. And just as the Old Testament, just as Genesis, Exodus, second book of the Bible, here we're already seeing God working. We're already seeing the works of Jesus Christ just here in the second book. And we're seeing it taking place now. I truly do believe that we are living in the times of revelation. We are watching it take place. We are watching the events unfold. And Jesus Christ is still living and He's still working. And I'm thankful for His sacrifice by blood on that bronze altar. And I'm thankful for the cleansing power of the laver in which God came unto us that we might be washed by His blood. The court of the tabernacle. That's the first layer into the entering of the tabernacle. You see, this tabernacle was a holy place God commanded unto Moses to create. He wanted, he had a hunger for his people. He wanted his people and he wanted to be in their presence. Today, we have a hunger and a thirst for Christ and he wants to be in our presence. He wants to be in our presence so much that he sent his darling lamb that he might die for our sins, that we might meet with him. And just as he did this with this people, he sent us a sacrifice that we could have a presence with Him. After entering unto the court of the tabernacle, we go in through this first veil. And this veil, of course, blocked from the outside of the court. And this veil was, as soon as you enter in unto the tabernacle, it's dark. Except for one little area. And that's the light. That's the golden, that's the golden lampstand or the menorah. This golden lampstand was fed with oil. This oil was used as a cleanser. This oil was used as an anointer. As the Holy Spirit anoints us with this cleansing oil as we are anointed with His presence. Are we anointed with God's presence? Just as if these people, as this light was anointed. If you're a saved Christian today, you're carrying that light. And there is an oil needed to fulfill that light. That oil is found in the Word of God. And that oil is found through God's presence. And I tell you today, if you are a saved Christian, we have to have the oil to feed us. We have to have the oil to keep that light shining. I'll tell you today, we live in a lost and dying world. And this world is filled with darkness. And this world is filled with pain and torture and misery. But God gave us that shining light that we might carry it. We are the light on the hill. We are that high kingdom God's given us. And I'm thankful for the Lord today. It is the golden lampstand that is symbolism of Jesus Christ and His light. It is the symbolism of Christ and the light He carried throughout the lost and dying world. It speaks for Him as the light of the world. And it speaks for us as if we are supposed to carry that light and we are supposed to be fed by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of oil and then the light that is shown. We can find the golden lampstand in Exodus chapter 25, verses 31 through 40. 
Exodus 25, 31 through 40. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, and beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same. And the six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches on the candlestick on one side, and three branches of the candlestick out the other side. Three bowls made unto the almonds, with a knob and a flower on one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, with a knob and a flower, so in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds, with their knobs and their flowers. And there shall be a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, and a knob under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knobs and their branches shall be the same, all it shall be one beaten work of pure gold." And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and thou the light and the lamps thereof, and thou shalt give light over it, against it, and the tongs thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof, shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold he make it, and with the vessels, and look thou that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. I've explained to you what this lampstand means, and inside of the tabernacle, this was the only source of light. This tabernacle is where we met with God, or the Israelites met with God in this time. And it was that golden lampstand that shone light to the entire tabernacle. That was the only bit of light left. And that would be to your right as you enter in into the tabernacle. And to your left would be the table of shewbread, mentioned in Exodus 25, verses 23 through 30. The table of shoe bread. Thou shalt also make a table of shatim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit of breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half of height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereunto a crown of gold round about it. And thou shalt make it unto a border of a hand breadth round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for the places and the staves to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of shatim wood, and overlay them with gold, and the table may be borne with them. And thou shalt make of the dishes thereof, and the spoons thereof, and the covers thereof, and the bowls thereof, to cover with all. And pure gold shalt thou make them, and thou shalt, shalt set upon the table shoe bread before me away. See, this table of shewbread would have been to your left as you walk in right across from the golden lampstand of the menorah. These twelve pieces of shewbread represented the twelve tribes of Israel. The twelve loaves were a reminder that God sought to be in His people's presence. It was also a symbol, it's symbolism of how God feeds His people and how He is a provider. God will provide for His people, I will say, in this modern day. As we grow hungry for God, as this, as this world starves us of what we need, God is always there and He will always provide. He is the honey in the rock. He is what we need. He is the bread that we need. He is the bread of life. Christ is what gave His life that we might eat. I'm thankful for the Lord and I'm thankful for His providing of His people and for the symbolism of God's feeding to a lost and dying world. I'm thankful that when we're hungry for God, He gives us a preacher or He gives us a man of God to come to us that we might feel God's presence. I'm thankful that we carry His Word that feeds us with His Holy Spirit. I'm thankful for God and I'm thankful that as we enter into the holy place, we have the light that is Jesus Christ and we have the provider and we have the food that is Jesus Christ. As we go through, we're going to continue on throughout the holy place. I'd like you to flip to Exodus chapter 30 if you would please. Exodus chapter 30, verses 1 through 10. Now we find the golden altar of incense, which is directly in front of the, the second veil, or the inner veil as it is called. The golden altar of incense, starting in chapter 30 of Exodus, verses 1 through 10. And thou shalt make an altar to burn incense of palm, of shatim wood shalt thou make it, and a cubit shall be the length thereof, and a cubit shall be the breadth thereof, four square shall it be, and two cubits shall be the height thereof, the horns thereof shall be the same. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, the top thereof, and the sides thereof round about, and the horns thereof. And thou shalt make unto it a crown and gold round about it. And the two golden rings, thou shalt make it unto the crown thereof, and the two corners thereof, upon the two sides of it shalt thou make it. And they shall be with four places for the staves to bear it withal. 
and thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood and overlay them with gold, and thou shalt put it before the veil that is the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony where I meet with thee. And Aaron shall burn thee sweet incense every morning when he dresseth the lamps, he shall put incense upon it. And when Aaron lighten in the lamps at even, he shall burn the incense upon it in a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall offer no strange incense thereon, nor burnt sacrifice, nor meat offering, neither shall thou pour drink offering thereon. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it at once in a year with the blood of a sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make an atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord." You see, I read all this Scripture because Scripture is important to know. And it's important that we recognize what God is doing. If you've paid attention to the Scripture that I've read so far, God is not asking these people to do it. He is commanding them. He's saying, I want to be in thy presence. If you want to join me in my presence, I'm going to command you to do these things. And if you look at God here, He's given direct directions. Oftentimes, how many times does the Lord give us direct directions and we think, well, maybe I can do something just a little bit different, Lord. How many times has God called us to do something? Or how many times has God led us to do something? And we come to God, well, maybe I can do it a little bit different. He said, if you want to meet with me, you're going to have to do it my way. And the way is through Jesus Christ on Calvary. And I'll tell you today, you can't get to heaven on your way. You can't receive salvation on your way. I'm telling you today, there's plenty of people in this lost and dying world. And they're sitting on a church pew. And they're reading their Bible. And they think they've got everything they need. And they donate money to the church. And there's still people doing those things that are going to go to hell because they haven't followed by God's direct rules and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did on Calvary on our behalf and for our sins. God gives us direct directions on what we need to do. This golden altar of incense was made of both wood and gold. Shittim wood and gold. You see... Oftentimes when we think of Jesus Christ as we should think of Jesus Christ, we think of Him in His deity. We think of Him as God, the Son of God. We look at Him as God come into the form of man. But with His deity, which is symbolized in the gold, there is also the wood which symbolizes the man that was in Christ. You see, God had to create a bridge and a gap for us to achieve salvation. And that salvation was through making God a man. And that sacrifice was made by Him being both 100% God God and 100% man. You see, this wood here, this wood represents the man that was in Jesus Christ. I often think about when Jesus Christ was splintered against the cross of Calvary, that He automatically go back to His childhood working in the carpenter shop underneath His daddy. That He automatically go back to thinking, oh, I was the carpenter's son once, and here I am being splintered upon the cross for the sins of many. I think about Jesus Christ and how He represents both the wood and the gold and how with God we have God, but even without Him we are nothing. We couldn't be received of salvation if it hadn't been for God becoming a man. It is if God is too powerful, God is too strong, God is too big to come here, which is why He had to come here in the form of man. He had to lower Himself that He might join in with us as we must lower ourselves that He might grow inside of us. The golden altar of incense. It is a reminder that we can only pray to the Father because of the intercessory work of the Son. We wouldn't be here today without the Holy Trinity. It is the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, one God, one Trinity, three. I'll tell you today, it is because of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice He made that we can have prayer to the Father. He is the intercessor. He did the works that we might have a relationship with God the Father. This incense is a symbolism of the offering of prayer. And this fire is symbolism of the Holy Spirit which was given unto us. And this I've talked about so far. I've talked about the court of the tabernacle. I've talked about the holy place. And now God has led us to the holy of holies. This is the most important place of the tabernacle of God. You see, as we've walked through, we've seen the many things. We've seen the the altar of sacrifice and the altar of blood and fire. And then as we walked forward, we saw this, this bronze laver. And as we washed there, so first we saw the sacrifice by blood, then we saw the cleansing power in the holy water, and then as we entered in through the first veil, we found the table of shoe bread, the providing of God, and now we have seen the light. 
And of course now we have seen the final thing that is in the holy place, and that is the golden altar of incense. As you can see, like I said, from Genesis to Revelation, Jesus Christ has taken part in every single event to take place in human history. He is the Almighty. He is the leader. He is the powerful. He is the Almighty. And I'm telling you today that God needs to have place in every single part of every single thing that we do. He needs to have part in our jobs and in our families and in our homes and in our lives. So many people think, well, I can come to God on Sunday, but the Christian you are on Sunday don't matter. It's the Christian on Monday that matters. What are you going to be on the job site? What are you going to be at the schoolhouse? What Christian are you going to so-called act like? You can't live a double life in front of Christ. You're either 100% in or 100% out. That's how this works. Now that we have passed through both the court of the tabernacle and through the holy place, we now enter in into the holy of holies. But before we enter into the holy of holies, we must recognize the sacrifice we have seen before. And not only that, we must, we must pass through the inner veil. It is this veil in Exodus 26, verse 33. I ask you to flip with me there, please. Exodus 26, verse 33. It is this veil that gives us the ability to pass through. Now we are not in the holy place, but we are now in the holies of holies, the most high place. This is where God's presence takes place. This is where we meet with God. This is where those priests in the days of the Israelites, this is where they would come on the Day of Atonement once a year. This is where they would find the redemption of their sins. This is where they would meet with God. But they could not do it without passing through that inner veil. It is said that these priests at the time, they'd be so scared of the power of God and what God would do because if you were to walk in there and not be 100% right with God, not be cleansed, not go through the sacrificial processes, it's said that they would tie a rope around their ankle, that when they enter in, if they'd be struck down by God in His wrath, somebody would be able to take them on out. I'm thankful that God... We don't have to fear coming to Him, but we can come to Him with love and we can come to Him with, with when we're in our painful times, when we're in our joyous times, when we're in our angry and mad times. We can always come to God and He gave us that ability. But we had to pass through the inner veil. Verse 33 of Exodus chapter 26 says, And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches that thou mightest bring in thither with the veil of the ark of the testimony. And the veil shall divide you between the holy place and the most holy. And thou shalt put the mercy seat upon the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. But I'd like to focus on, And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy. As we look at this, there is a division. There's a division between man and between God. And in these times, in the times of the Israelites, these people, oftentimes as you looked across the world, these people, they would be against God. There's so many false idols out there, so many false deities and beings that these people go out and praise. There was a division between man and between God. But God sought to be in our presence. God wanted, He had a want for His children. He had a desire to keep us in His hearts and in His mind. I'm thankful for a God who wanted me when it felt like nobody else wanted me. I'm thankful it's in those times that I was down on my face crying. I'm thankful it's those times that I feel like the whole world's against me and I feel like I've got nothing left to go. I'm thankful that it's in those times that God is with us and God has a want for us and He wants to do so much great in you. I'm telling you, if there's a lost person in here today who hadn't given their life to Christ, there's so much God wants to do with you. There's so much happiness and build up He wants to do inside of you. You just got to give your life to Him. But we have to pass through this inner veil before we can enter in unto the Holy of Holies. You ask me, what is this inner veil? This inner veil is the visual representation of the body of Christ Jesus. It is through Him that we have the ability to meet with God. It is through Him we have the ability to feel God's presence. It is through Him we have the ability to enter in and feel the presence of God in the holies of holies and in that holy, holy place. It is the veil that was hung between. It was a divider. Jesus, rather than being a divider, He combined man and God. He is the bridge. There was once a day we wouldn't have been able... I, my preacher likes to say, I didn't hear no cattle trailers rolling up in here this morning. I didn't hear a cattle trailer rolling in here for us to do a yearly sacrifice that we might meet with God once a year and seek redemption for our sins. I know that Jesus Christ made the sacrifice. He was the ultimate sacrifice. He was the veil. And if you know your Bible well, if you look over in the New Testament, it says as soon as Christ led up the ghost, 
The veil was rent in twain from top to bottom. The veil, the veil that was pierced on the cross for our transgressions. Jesus Christ who gave His life that we might live. Jesus Christ that gave us the holy ability that we might meet with God. He gave His body. As you know, you can see the many things that God, that Christ had to go through upon Calvary's cross. Beaten with the cat of nine tails. Crowned with the crown of thorns. Pierced in His side. Nails through His hands and through His feet. It is through the pain that God gave on Calvary's cross. It is through the pain and the torture and the destruction of the veil that we might enter in and meet with God. It is that ultimate sacrifice that this veil, this inner veil represents. It is passed through only once a year on the Day of Atonement. I'm thankful that I can come to my God whenever I please. It's not just once a year. It's not just one annual event. It is an event I can come to whenever I please. I'm thankful that though there's many false prophets and false teachers out there today who can only go to their gods every so often or they can only go to their gods at this specific time, I'm thankful for a God who gave me the ability. I can meet with Him anywhere, any way, anyhow. I can do it whenever I please. I can meet with God. The inner veil. Now that we have passed through this inner veil, the representation of Christ's body, which He gave up the Spirit that we might enter in, God has given us the ability to enter in unto the Holy of Holies. You ask, well, what is in the Holy of Holies? What is so special that we have to enter in through the veil? What is so special? It is God's divine presence. It is God's holy presence that makes place inside of us. God... As this place, you know, your body is the temple of God. Just as this temple was a physical temple, now we have the physical temple or the spiritual temple living inside of us. It is God who back then the physical temple was only to be visited once a year. We could only feel God's presence once a year. These priests, the sons of Aaron and Aaron himself. But now the temple is living inside of us. We are the walking and talking temple. God is living inside of us. It is when we can meet with His Spirit whenever we please. God gave us that ability through Christ Jesus and like I said back to the Holy of Holies as we pass through the veil of the temple the inner veil we now enter in into the Holy of Holies the most holy place the most holy Exodus chapter 25 verses 10 through 22 speak of this this holy thing that God created this holy thing has been I, I, everybody should know what this was if you've read through the Old Testament. It was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant. As I've read through these scriptures, it keeps talking about the rings and the wood of which you have to hold it. You see, these items were so holy that they needed these rings that you might put staves through them, that they might be carried, that they might not be touched. That's how holy they were. It is said that if somebody were to touch the Ark of the Covenant itself, they would be struck down by God immediately and face His wrath because this is a holy thing. This is what God created. This is where His presence sits. I will explain this to you in a few moments. Verse 10 of chapter 25 of Exodus says, And they shall make an ark of shittim wood, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and thou shalt make it upon a crown of gold and round about. And thou shalt cast four rings of the gold for it, and put them in the four corners thereof, and two rings shall be in the one side of it, and two rings on the other side of it. And thou shalt make staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold. And thou shalt put the staves into the rings by the sides of the ark, that the ark may be borne with them. The staves shall be the rings of the ark, that it might be taken from it. And thou shalt put the ark, the testimony which I give thee. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit shall be the breadth thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, and beaten shall they work with them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and take one cherub on the end, and the other cherub on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, and the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the ark, and in the ark shalt thou put the testimony that I shall give thee, and there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from the mercy seat. For the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. As you can see here, the reason we enter in has become this ark of the covenant and this mercy seat mentioned here in the text. 
This is where God's divine presence was located. This is where God met with the Israelites. This is where God met with His people. It is through the living ark. It is through this ark that these people could meet with God. And this spake for offer. After God affirmed the covenant and spake His offerings of the tabernacle, the first, men, or the first item He mentions is the Ark of the Covenant. I've been doing this in an order as walking through the tabernacle. God did this from what was most important. And like I said, He started none other with the Ark of the Covenant. This is where God's mercy rested. This is where God rested with His people. It's where His glory rested. And as you heard, this, this Ark held the tables of the law, and that you can read that in Exodus 25, verse 16, and right here in the Scripture. Um, and like I was saying, forgive me, but God, this is where He rested. And there were some items that rested within this holy ark. You see, like, like I said, the tables of the law. And then you also had Aaron's rod that budded. That is mentioned in Numbers 16 and 17. Then you got the third item, which was a pot of manna, which is read in Exodus 32 through 34. You see, all three items that were located inside of the Ark of the Covenant were, locate, or were related to rebellion. How many times have we rebelled against God? How many times have we as sinners rebelled against God and what God wanted us to do? How many times were we supposed to be following the will of God and we turned the other cheek and we walked away? You see, God wanted us in His presence. But see, these things were led to rebellion. These rebellious items could have brought judgment upon the people if not for the mercy seat in which God's glory rested upon. You see, this mercy seat that God sat upon, this is where God rested. See, this mercy seat, on the day of atonement was sprinkled with the blood. It was the blood that covered up the sins. It was the blood that covered up the rebellion led by these people, the rebellion, these rebellious items. Of course, the tables of law were associated with the making of the golden calf. And Aaron's rod is associated with the rebellion led by Korah. And this pot of manna is associated with the Israel's complaining in the wilderness. You see, it is all these rebellious items located within that should have brought judgment upon you and I. It is the rebellious spirit and the rebellious flesh that we carry that should have brought judgment from God. But rather than judging us, He sent down the living mercy seat that Jesus Christ might cover up our sins, that it might be His blood where God was located, that it might cover up who we truly was. And now, now we know that we are no longer sinners, but we have been saved by Christ. The Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. See, these items could have brought such judgment upon the people, but the blood covered their sins. And rather than seeing their sins, and rather than seeing their rebellion, what did God see? He saw the mercy that He had upon them, and He saw the blood. Just as if God saw the blood on Calvary's cross that forgave our sins, it is when Christ led up the ghost that man might receive His Spirit, that man might receive God for who He truly was and who Jesus Christ is. And I'm thankful for the death, but most of all, I'm thankful that three days later He rose from the grave. I'm thankful I'm not supporting no dead God. I'm thankful that my God's not in a grave somewhere. I'm thankful that my God's risen and He's coming back one of these days. I'll meet Him in the air with all the other saints and I'm thankful for God. Like I said, it's by the blood. It is by the blood that we know Christ. It is by the blood that we have met with Him. You see, I've mentioned this Day of Atonement. There's so much that goes into the Day of Atonement. And like I said, this was an event that took once a year. Aaron and his sons, who were the first priests, and they had to meet with God in this, in this place this tabernacle and it is through God that they could feel His presence and it is through this tabernacle that they could feel His presence. But there was one more event that took place. I've walked you through. I've walked you through the court of the tabernacle and the holy place and we've walked through the holy of holies by far. The most holy, the most high. This is where God's glory rested. And now we walk back through the tabernacle of God. And we walk back to the court. And now we're walking outside of the court. This is the event that took outside of the court of the tabernacle. You see this tabernacle had these makeshift walls around it. It was not, it was not open to the other parts of the encampment. Like I said, there was a divide between man and God in this time. Just as if these veils and curtains that covered up the tabernacle were covered up. by This, this is what covered up God in this time and hid Himself from man, but God had a want for them. 
there's a, I, if you'd like to, you can flip to Leviticus chapter 16, verses 15 through 34. It talks about another event that takes place outside of, of the camp, or outside, yes, outside of the encampment, but also outside of the tabernacle. And that is none other than the scapegoat or the goat sacrificial death. It is the scapegoat starting in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 15. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for his people and bring the blood with the veil and do that blood which he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place and the uncleanliness of the children of Israel because of their transgressions and their sins. So shall he do the tabernacle of the congregation that he remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth into making atonement in the holy place until he come out and be made atonement for himself and for his household and for the congregation of Israel. And like uh, continuing with the scripture, we see this goat. We see these two kid goats. And this was these two kid goats were equaled one sin offering unto God. These two goats, you see, one of them would be killed and died as a sin offering for the whole nation. One would be killed that its blood might be spilled upon the mercy seat, that it might cover up our sins, or that it might cover up the sins of the people of Israel. But that other goat, I, say, I call it the scapegoat, because that's what the Bible refers to it as, the scapegoat. This scapegoat, it was the goat that, it was symbolism of how these people would symbolize the cleansing of their sins. And on this day of atonement, they would take this goat and they would sacrifice it. And with the other goat, the scapegoat, they would let it loose out of the encampment. And see, this scapegoat symbolically carried the sins of the people and was sent out into the wilderness never to be seen again. See, our God casted our sins as far as the east is from the west. And just as this scapegoat carried the sins of the people, and just as this scapegoat carried those sins out of the encampment, out of our lives, out of, it, out of people's lives in this day and age of the Israelites, Jesus made that same sacrifice. He was the goat that, uh, that was slain. He was the one that was slain for our sins and transgressions. But at the same time, He was the one that removed our sins and transgressions. And He casted our sins so far out, you ain't never going to receive them again. You've been, if you've been saved, we are still sinners because we are robed in flesh. But when saved... You have now achieved eternal salvation. This is what God has led us to do. This is what God has done for us and by us. As I've gone through, I can go back and show you through everywhere. If you've paid attention through the Word of God and through what's been said, God has taken place in every single part of this tabernacle. And just as we are living with God today, these people had a hunger for God just as God had a hunger for them and it is the same today as it was then. After all spoken, we can come to the conclusion that Christ should be involved in every aspect of everything from Genesis to Revelation throughout our lives. He is our salvation. And as we go through, I'd like to make some points here. He is our sacrifice by fire and blood. He is our cleanser and He is our washer. He is our provider and He is in our presence. He is our light of the world and He is our anointer of holy oil. He is our intercessor and He is our holy fire. He is our welcomer and He is our way maker. He is our merciful caretaker and He is our forgiver. And He is our scapegoat and the remover of our sin. As you can see, before we can meet with God, there had to be sacrifice. And it is through the sacrifice of Christ Jesus and it is through these roles that he played in our lives it is through these things that we can meet with God or that the Israelites can meet with God and that we can meet with God there had to be a sacrifice and that sacrifice was the life of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on Calvary is what saved our souls from hell and I'll tell you today if there be a lost person in the presence I recommend if you want to meet Christ one day I recommend you crawl, you crawl down to an old fashioned altar and you get right with God and you meet with Him because He did all of these things for us. There was a day that Christ crawled Golgotha's hill that He might make intercessory prayer for our behalf that He might meet with us that He might bridge the gap and the divide between man and between God and it is through Him we have salvation. I'm thankful for God in each role He played. I'm thankful for this tabernacle that we have walked through together. 
I'm thankful for the sacrifice He made just as we honor those lives on Memorial Day who died for our freedom in foreign lands. There was once a great soldier, there was once a great fighter for God who died for our sins, who died for our freedom, freedom from sin. We no longer have to carry the bondages and burdens of sin because God has freed us from them. He has broken the chain. He has made a way for us to walk. He has made a holy fire to live within us. He's made a merciful caretaker and a welcomer and an intercessor. God has done this for us. And as we honor those throughout this week who passed away, that we might have freedom in this great nation. There was one who gave His life for us. There was one who gave us the freedom of sin. That one day we might enter in unto His great nation. That we might enter in into the sky. That we might meet with God. That we might go off to that far place and that far land. That we might go to that holy destination. It is through God who died for us, who made the sacrifice for us. It is through Him we can achieve salvation. It is through Him God has led us and guided us and directed us. I ask you today that if there be a lost person in this presence, I recommend that you get right with God. I recommend that you, if you need to talk to somebody from what I've seen in this church, I can just feel the presence of God just walking in here, Pastor. I'm, it's very good to be in here. I'm thankful. See, my nerves were so... My nerves were so, I was so anxious and I was so scared and I've been told that the nerves really never go away when you're supposed to set yourself aside from God. But here's the thing, when you come unto a place like this and you just look at people and you don't look and see strangers, you look and see your brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm so very thankful for you all. I'm thankful for the opportunity you've given me, Pastor. I'm thankful for God's Word and what He did for us. I'm thankful that as we honor those on Memorial Day who died for us, I'm thankful that we have that one who we should always remember and who we should always make a memorial of, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ who made the sacrifice on our behalf. That's what God's put on my heart.